I'm in Toronto and I'm lucky enough to be joined by Rob James. It's nice to actually meet you and have you know who I am. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we've like I mean we've been chatting online for like what, like a, two years. Yeah, now? at least kind of... we have met twice before. Years ago. But you would not you would not remember that because you're kind of a big deal. Not that you aren't now. You had quite a few girls that you met, I'm sure. There were a few. I remember most of them. I swear. Yeah, right. Speaking of being a big deal, you were in McMaster and James. To use a cheesy pun, I'll say you were a sweet sensation. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> she went there. She? I did. It was an interesting experience. That I mean, it took a few years of development to, to get to that point, clearly. But a lot of people, when they look at the success, they say, oh, you guys kind of popped up out of nowhere. Well, overnight successes usually take a couple of years or three years to, to actually manifest. So. It was a long time coming. Was McMaster and James your first big introduction to music? Yes, I definitely, you know, um, to the, the, the public arena. Um, my parents threw me in voice lessons when I was a kid, and then I ended up singing at a few weddings, and that kind of jump started the whole. Thing. As far as performing in front of large audiences, that kind of that kind of took the cake right there. I remember one show we did in Winnipeg, and there were. 87,000 people there. That's huge. Yeah, it was really <laughs> It's been so long since I've really done something that uh, massive yeah. that I, it's it's kind of it's out of my mind. I don't even remember what it feels like to be in front of an audience that big. I just remember the sort of sea of people and, and the movement of the crowd. It was really um, surreal in a lot of ways to be in front of that many people. You're from Winnipeg. So going from this regular guy in Winnipeg to this huge deal. For this regular guy who everybody thinks is a huge deal. <laughs> I mean, that's just it. Everybody thought you were something. I mean, people asked me just recently who I was interviewing while I was in Toronto, and I told them your name. And they're like, oh, love wins every time. Like, people yeah. still remember you. I still remember. Well, those songs still get played on the radio quite a bit. They do. Um, I've been told that after 10 years, Songs like that enter what's called, uh, I think it's called legacy rotation on the radio, which basically <laughs> means they'll get played till the end of the end of time with like, you know, the the Guess Who and uh, whatever the really long classic, long term classic songs are. So I mean, it's that that to me is an accomplishment. It's like when it's a song gets to that point where people are going to actually be hearing it for the next forty years. And your legacy. Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You know? <laughs> your recording contract when you were with McMaster and James. It expired. Do you remember what year that was? We were in 2002, or early mid 2003. It wasn't so much an expiration as it was um, a parting of ways. The recording business is fairly complicated in politically and in the way it's structured. Basically, you have to find a way to get out of your contract. We were in a in a contract that, you know, you, you get one record and then we decide whether or not we want to do five more with you, you know, okay. like one at a time. And they had decided to do the second one, but weren't mm -hmm. ready to put out anything that we had actually sent to them. So it was this long, convoluted process where, you know, they have to decide whether or not they want to actually release the record, went past, and then we had to apply to get out of the contract and they have the right to keep us there. And it was a very, it's a very stressful time in, uh, Sounds like it. in our musical history. Would you ever be in a band again? Yeah, yeah I would. I mean, I'm working on some solo stuff right now. Hopefully I'll get to the point where I'm you know, back on the road and uh, I've got stuff on the radio. It's going in that direction right now. It won't be too long until I'm back on stage. Between 2002 and 2006, what were you up to? Various things. You know, when you go through um, kind of a big falling out like that with a record company and you know, I was, I was young at the time, I kind of came into the industry right out of high school and things blew up for me fairly quickly and it was only a couple of years before, you know, we were touring with NSYNC and Christina Aguilera, you know, it was, it was quick in that sense, but um, it fell just as quickly. So you go from nothing to high then to back to low, it, it, it sees disenchantment in you, you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, you know, especially when you're that young. Luke McMaster was a little different because he had spent a lot more time kind of building his, his 
trajectory into the business. He had done a couple of, he'd done a solo record, then he'd done something with another duo before, and he kind of had a longer trajectory going up. So his uh, disenchantment with the, with the business didn't come down as quickly as mine did. So I went through a period of complete, I don't want to do this. I'm going to go back to university. I'm going to get a real job. I'm going to be a regular guy. I bought a house and sort of chilled out in Winnipeg for a few years. And uh, everyone that I ran into, when they would ask me what I was doing, I was like, oh, I'm working here. I'm doing this and this. I'm in university. Why? What's wrong with you? I mean, you, you've got all this behind you. You've clearly got, uh, you know, some something to, to offer. Why aren't you doing it? It took a little bit of time to get myself back into that mentality where it was, you know, yeah, maybe I could do this again. Maybe I could actually be an artist again. It's, it's a very personal thing to be an artist, so you, you, it takes a lot out of you. And I wasn't sure if I had, you know, all that to give again. But then in 2006, you went to Canadian Idol. Yeah. What was that experience like for you? I had discussed the possibility with my old manager, because that was the, sort of the fourth season of Idol. I was looking at it as you know, a possible re-entry point just to test the water, see, you know, maybe you know, if people want to hear anything from me, then I'll do well. If not, then I'll just kind of fall by the wayside and then I have my answer. I don't need to go through the personal struggle of trying to figure out whether I want or not I want to do this again. I talked to a few other people in the industry and I, I got mixed reviews. Some people were like, yeah, you should definitely do it. Other people were like, no, no, you're gonna hurt your credibility and all that. Meanwhile, credibility speaking, I was sitting in my basement recording demos for basically anybody that would come to the door in, in Winnipeg. So there wasn't really that credibility per se. I knew I wasn't working on a career, so I, I basically decided um, on my manager's, my old manager's advice to try the idol. Um, yeah, got fairly far. You got to the top seven, right? Yeah. It surprised the crap out of me. Actually, Iowa has a very specific market group. You know, it's like young kids and their parents, for the most part. Especially in Canada, like that's yeah. kind of the. Um, you know, there's there's a, some young adults and in, uh, in there as well, but it's it's not like a a huge chunk of the market. So I was questioning whether or not um, you know I really appeal to that market. When we made top ten. I looked at the other people in the top ten, and out of the guys, there were five guys, clearly, um, I was the only one over the age of 21. Everyone else, like Tyler, Chad, Craig, you know, did, all those guys were under, well Tyler was 20, he was the oldest of the bunch, I was 28 at the time. Yeah. So. That's like the cutoff too, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, was, I was as old as I could possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> at least you went for it though. Yeah, uh, there were a few reasons. Few personal reasons why I, uh, I went for it, not even just to sort of figure out whether or not I was an artist, but I also felt the need to sort of see if I could get out of Winnipeg, you know, and, and try and push something of a career somewhere else, like either Toronto or I was contemplating New York, or Los Angeles, just literally getting up and moving and, and seeing what I could do. But it all depended on whether or not I could actually sustain some kind of, a, of an appeal. Yeah. Idol was a really good way of testing that. Were there advantages or disadvantages to having already been famous and then coming to Canadian Idol? There were both. When I went in for the very first audition, you, you go through you know, two people before you get to the executive producer or the producer on the site and uh, it was a guy a really good guy and honestly uh, he recognized me from the Christina Aguilera tour because okay. he, uh, he was somehow involved in the crew or uh, road managing the whole thing. He, he stopped me and he, <clears throat> I go through the process, you all sing, and then he, you know, say, you stay, you stay, and out of the, there were six people in my group, I was the only one that he asked to stay. And he's like, I'm just going to get you to sing again. And, that's, and they were all filing out. As soon as the door closed, he's like, okay, I don't really need to hear you sing again because I've seen you <laughs> sing. I saw you on stage, you know, with Christina and, and the whole thing. I just need to ask you a question. What are you doing here? 